At Little Cottonwood Creek, I saw a man whose life wasn't worth $10,000. Not even to himself. Frontier Gentlemen. with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just a moment, we will bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Do you like color in your news? Do you want the sidelights and the inside stories on the day's headlines? Then the program for you is The World Tonight, broadcast seven nights a week on most of the CBS radio stations. The World Tonight is the program that gives you the plus features in the news, the inside stories, the interesting interviews with personalities in the news, and the vital record testimony from important hearings and investigations. <laughs> Starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. It has been my intention to send these reports to the London Times in normal sequence. I find, however, that certain incidents take precedence over others. Therefore, I shall postpone writing of several unusual occurrences which took place in Dakota Territory in order to speak of the final chapter in the matter of Belle Siddons, alias Madame Birdie, Archie McLaughlin, and Boone May. It began about a month after McLaughlin and his band had attempted a hold-up on a stagecoach. Boone May was a peace officer in Deadwood, one of the most tenacious men I have ever met. He was determined to capture McLaughlin dead or alive, and I knew that he suspected Bell Siddons of being in partnership with the wanted man. The fact that I was well acquainted with the lady put me under the same shadow of suspicion. I had met Miss Siddons for lunch in Deadwood House, a comparatively respectable eating place. I thought she looked rather pale, tired. Have you heard from Boone May? In the past couple of days, no. I wondered... What's the matter, Bell? Nothing. McLaughlin? I don't know why I should care. It makes no sense. Have you heard from him? No. Do you know if he's still holding out in the timber? I don't know. And you're worried? Yes. He's not a good man. Feeling this way about him, I know it'll only cause me unhappiness. But you love him? I suppose I do. Do you think he loves you? In his way. Is that enough? If I could be with him, it would be. Well, why don't you go to him? No. Boone May is having me watched. I took the chance once, not again. Hmm. Hasn't McLaughlin tried to reach you? Sent a message? Two weeks ago. A note. Said he'd meet me in San Francisco. A place we talked about. Hmm. Perhaps he's gone then. I don't know. That's what I'm afraid of. And I don't know what to do, whether to go. I hate this stupidity behaving like a schoolgirl. First love, it's nonsense. Is it? It's interfering with my work. To be a good gambler, one must be able to think clearly. I can't. <laughs> Perhaps this is the time I should play 21 with you. Jeremy, what do you think I should do? Um, at this moment, look pleasant and unworried. Hmm? Good afternoon, madam. Candle, I've been looking for you. Now, will you sit down, Mr. May? Well, now, thank you. Got a piece of news for you, Kendall. Uh, we got one of the fellers was with McLaughlin the night of the holdup. Oh, which one? Brown. Johnny Brown. Silly son of a gun. I <laughs> beg your pardon, ma'am. He comes waltzing into town, goes down to Maggie's place, and one of my boys sees him and picks him up. Uh, what about McLaughlin? Oh, well, we got out of Johnny Boy, found out where they was holed up, went out to fetch him, but they already hightailed it out of there. You see, there's McLaughlin and Smith and Billy Mansfield. Any idea where they've gone? Not yet a while, but I'll get them. Oh, you wouldn't have heard any talk around, would you, madam? No. Why should I? Well, now I'll tell you why, ma'am. 
It seems that Johnny Brown was nigh to sacking his saddle a month back when a lady comes along and digs a hunk of lead out of it. Uh, Johnny Brown says the lady was you. He's a liar. Well, now, madam, right now it'd be his word against yours, and, well, I ain't so sure which one to stand up in trial. I don't see much sense in arresting you for a merciful act that you done. But I could for not informing the law where a wanted man was hiding out. The man's a liar. I've never even heard of him. Now, he says different. But it ain't worth arguing. Now, now this Johnny Brown, he done a lot of talking. And he figures McLaughlin's going to pick up the buried loot he's been collecting. And he'll be ahead for San Francisco. Johnny says he's got a lady friend in San Francisco. You ever hear tell of such a thing, Mr. madam? Mr. McLaughlin never confided in me to that extent. Well, now, I thought maybe he had. You and him being kind of close. W what do you think, Kendall? I don't. Of course, now, maybe McLaughlin's still around, uh, waiting for a chance to see you, madam, before he goes. You know, I'd surely take it as a kindness if you'd tell me uh, if and he shows up. But I guess that's asking too much now, isn't it? Mr. Kendall... Please excuse me. <laughs> Out there was a mean, mad woman. Do you blame her? You know the way she feels about McLaughlin. Well, sure I do. I just want to see how she'd take the news. Oh, you've tried that before. You know what? There's a fact, Kendall. Except in uh, maybe you noticed that I had better luck this time. You still think she's working with McLaughlin? I tell you she's not. Well, she's his woman. She already broke the law going to him when he asked her to take the bullet out of Brown. Mm. You went too, Kendall. You knew? I told you, that there Johnny Brown, he talked like a Texan. If and I was mine to, you know I could arrest you for that. I imagine you could. I just kind of figured that you and me thought together. Now, why, why didn't you tell me you was with her when she went out to fix up that Johnny Brown? Two reasons. First, I'm a newspaper correspondent. It was my job. I wanted to protect my story. Why ain't your job to protect outlaws? No. You? But I gave my word. That's the second reason. Two of the men wanted to make trouble. Mm. They weren't going to let us leave the shack that night. They might have come to shoot him. I don't condone what McLaughlin's done. I don't like what he is. But Madame Birdie could have been killed if he hadn't taken our side. That's why I gave my word. You know, that word of yours, that broke the law. It's a good thing, Kendall, that I got a liking for you. Because, you know, if and I didn't, I could have you making hair bridles for the next five years. Long sentence. Yeah. Now, that McLaughlin, he got maybe $10,000 or better cast away somewhere. It's company money he's stolen in gold. You know, I got to get it back. Now, if I can get the money along with McLaughlin... That there'd be a real good thing. Savvy? I gather that either Madame Verdi or I am supposed to know where it's hidden. Yeah. I don't. Hmm. I doubt whether she does. Well, it might be you don't. <laughs> I ain't so sure about her. Tell me, was that true about McLaughlin going to San Francisco? That's what Johnny Brown says. Of course, now, I don't figure he'll ever make it. Well, I'd say he's got a fair chance. You sitting here, he's riding west. Uh, Cheyenne... He stopped there for a while. That Johnny Brown was supposed to catch up with him there. And Johnny won't, but I will. Uh, would you mind uh, taking a longish ride with me, Kendall? You see, that way you can do a writing chore and I can keep an eye on you. Uh, you afraid I'd tell her where we're going? Wouldn't you? Probably. That's what I mean. Come on. Maury Amsterdam, Joan Alexander, Bill Balance, and Jim Backus will make up the panel of experts later today on CBS Radio's lively guessing game, Says Who. What makes the prospect so pleasing is the fact that this famous foursome, taken one at a time or collectively, are all people of high good humor and wit. For fun and excitement, join them on CBS Radio later today as most of these same stations present Says Who. <laughs> accompanied me while I went to my hotel to pack my saddlebags. And an hour later, we took the stage out of Deadwood for Cheyenne in Wyoming Territory. There were just the two of us, 
and the only stops we made during the entire journey were for meals or stations at which the horses were changed. But in spite of his precautions, Boone May hadn't counted on Madame Verdi. While we were making our way to Cheyenne, she had not been idle. The lady had heard of our hurried departure from Deadwood and found out the reason for it. A few hours after we left, a deputy peace officer more interested in money than law paid her a visit. His name was Harry Morgan. What's your proposition, ma'am? Would you like to earn a thousand dollars? Yes, ma'am. You've heard of Archie McLaughlin? Yes, ma'am, I've heard. They say he's in Cheyenne. That's what I hear tell. Boone May's going out to pick him up. Yes, ma'am. If he takes him, he'll bring him back to Deadwood. You want that happening? No. A man named Kendall's with May. They left by stage. You reckon they'll come back same way? Yes. You asking a lawman like me to stop that stage and set an outlaw like Archie McLaughlin free? Yes. You know, as them say, McLaughlin's got better than 10,000 heads somewhere. You and him partners? No. Suppose Boone May don't catch McLaughlin. Be a long ride to Cheyenne for May to stop an empty stage. 500 for the ride if May hasn't caught him. 2,000 if Archie's in the coach and you get him out. How come you think maybe I won't turn you into Boone May for asking that? Because I know you won't. That's why I asked you to come here. Uh-huh. It'll take some man. Boone might have other guards with him. It's no job for a man alone. Figure four others would be safer along with me. That's up to you. Two thousand don't go far. Split up between five. Twenty-five hundred, then. That sounds fair. When will you leave? As soon as I round up the boys. All right. If you get to him, tell him to go to San Francisco. Tell him I'll meet him there. Yes, ma'am. One more thing. Do you know what Mr. Kendall looks like? Yes, ma'am. He's that newspaper fellow. I see him. He's not to be hurt. Well, no telling what happens in a shooting match. Boone May ain't likely to give up McLaughlin so easy. You, uh, you reckon you better get me some money before I go? The boys will want some. I'll give you 500 now. The rest will be on deposit for you at the bank. Collectible if Archie's free. Uh-huh. I reckon it's better if you give me 2500 now. If I don't get McLaughlin, or if Boone May ain't caught him, why, well, I'll give you back the 2000 I fine. <laughs> no. You don't trust me? No. <laughs> the way I see you ain't got no choice. I don't trust you to pay me later, so you got to trust me. You got to if you want your Archie back. Wait here. I'll get your money. And <laughs> yeah, I says to her, you got to if you want your Archie back. And she hands over the whole thing, 2500 Now, boys, seems to me we're working mighty cheap to take a chance like getting a prisoner away from Boone May. I, I ain't all fired anxious to get in a powder-burning contest with Boone. I seen him use artillery. He ain't the fastest, nor he ain't the slowest by long way. Against five of us, Boone May ain't no bigger fool than another man. Besides, we ain't gonna take that big a chance. If he got too many for us, we'll take to the two to split the dinero, let it go at that. But if we can take... He's a talk, Morgan. I hear tell Archie's got 10,000 or more here, or maybe carrying on him. Now, that's worth saving any man for. Any man? 10,000. Which, along with his 2,500, makes fair fighting wages. What do you say? Now, wait a minute. How's about Boone May? He recognizes us. He'll be gunning for us. Pinky, wasn't you never a vigilante? Mass, we'll wear masks. Now, you got any more food questions, ask them later. Well, travel light, boys. I'll meet you back here a half hour. These conversations, plans we knew nothing about as our stage rolled on toward Cheyenne. Boone May seemed uncommonly sure about his chances of capturing McLaughlin. At the time, I didn't share his optimism, which, as it turned out, was a mistake on my part. I should have known better than to underestimate his capabilities. Boone May was a very thorough man.
A gentleman of sentiment, our man about music, is Mitch Miller on CBS Radio. Sunday evenings, he gathers unto himself a group of show folks of equal sentiment and talent for a bull session on the trade. Mitch and his friends do their talking right before CBS Radio's microphones, where everyone can hear them. Tonight and every Sunday, over most of these stations, get the inside story on show business from The Mitch Miller Show. <laughs> report that Archie McLaughlin and his two companions were captured after a bitter gun battle would make colorful reading, but such was not the case. When we arrived in Cheyenne, the men were already in custody of the Cheyenne Marshal. Boone May had telegraphed ahead. And four hours after receiving a message, McLaughlin, Mansfield, and Smith were arrested while drinking a toast to freedom. They were put in irons. And accompanied by one other Cheyenne peace officer, we started on a return journey by stage to Deadwood. I'll be passing through Fort Laramie directly. And hey, maybe you boys like to take your last look. I'll be coming this way again. If you do, you're going to be an old, old man, McLaughlin. The charges against you is going to add up the more years than any man's got a right to live. Bet you wish they'd hang us, huh, Boom? Maybe you deserve to, Mansfield, but the law is the law. <laughs> And the law says you're going to stand trial for robbery. You get a fair shake in Deadwood. Robbery ain't a hanging crime like in some places. How come you're along with him, Kendall? I think Mr. May was afraid that Madam Birdie and I would ride to Cheyenne to warn you. How is she? Better than she'll be when she sees you like this. Oh, you've won. You've got your man. Why rub salt in the wound? Hmm. What'd you do with the money you had, McLaughlin? What money? That 10000 or more. Well, ain't no use playing ignorant. Half of Deadwood knows about that loot. But it'll go easy at the trial if you turn it back to the company. Sorry, Boone. I got all kinds of plans what to do with it. it ain't gonna do you no good in the Husky. What's the matter, Boone? You gonna lose reward money if Archie don't fess up? The law go easier on you. That's what I'm saying. You know, hearing you talk curls my gut, Boone. Least ways I don't mind admitting I'm a no good highline rider. Only difference between us is you hide behind a badge for your kind of steel. You lie, McLaughlin. I never stole in my life. Talk about law, Kendall. Get this here peace officer to tell you about the times he shut an eye when a gold shipment's been. Kendall! Get out of that coat, or we'll make wolf meat out of you. <laughs> it's a holdup, Boone. <laughs> Got you on both sides and behind. Get out, slow hands. Way high, you hear? What's the matter, Boone? Ain't you gonna fight back? Man's a fool to take our more than he can handle. There's too many of them. Well, I'm right glad to see you, boys. Archie McLaughlin's the name. This here's Boone May, peace officer in Deadwood, taking me and my pals in. You're Boone May, huh? That's right. Thank you. Take your gun. Sure. All right, Boone May, you and the other fella, you stand right there. Driver, stay up on that box. You, McLaughlin, the other two, get over here under the tree. Don't seem like no proper hold up to me. I have an idea it isn't. That's just fine, McLaughlin. Uh, Feller's voice. Now, we ain't gonna waste time. I swear I heard it before. Might be coming along the trail. Cup, you boys, get that rope over that limb yonder. A uh, necktie mm. party for Boone May? You won't see no weeping from me, Mister. You ain't got it straight, McLaughlin. It's like this: we're vigilantes, see, law and order. That's us. Now we know all about you. We know what you've done. Why you going back to Deadwood? But we figure it ain't right you should get off without paying for your sins. So, McLaughlin, if you're carrying that $10,000 or whatever, you hand it over right now. I ain't carrying nothing. Boone, may you take it off him? No, he never had it. Now, look, you want to help the law, that's just fine, Shut but that ain't going to... Boone! Where's your head, McLaughlin? No use asking, mister. Archie ain't gonna do you no good, Dad. Not much sense you fellas getting strung up on kind of him. You won't tell us? We don't know. How's about it, McLaughlin? Go ahead, hang me. I ain't giving you nothing. You figure maybe we don't mean business? 
You, what's your name? Smith, Jack Smith. You got a prayer? Say it. Archie, tell him. Archie. Oh, my God. That's murder. Murder, you can't do that. I done it, Boone May. You won't be next. Now, you see, McLaughlin? Now, you know, because you seen I ain't no flannel mouth. I ask you, where's that money head? Oh, go. You man. tell him, Arch. You got to tell. There's no call for us to get murdered on account of money. What good's it? What good, Arch? Tell him. All right, boys, get the rope around his neck. No. Take that one first. No, Arch, tell him. Tell us, please. It ain't my fault, I tell you. You tell him, McLaughlin. Don't do it. That's a spit you please. wish you had in your throat by and oh, by, please. Mr. String him up. Don't! 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 A moment later, the rope was put around McLaughlin's neck. He didn't fight, only stood there waiting. And then they lynched him. After that, the five masked men rode away. Boone May and I cut down McLaughlin's body and buried him under the tree with Mansfield and Smith. Then we went back to Deadwood. It was early morning when we arrived. I went straight to Belle Siddons. She'd been asleep. Looked very young, fragile. She listened dry-eyed. He didn't tell? No. He should have. I wish he had. It was my fault. I wanted to help him. You knew what was going to happen? Those men? I sent them. I killed him. Please, go away. Yes. I'm sorry. Candle. You tell her? Yes. Oh, that's good. Oh, I'm glad you did. A fellow like you knows how to do a thing like that. Yes, I am very good at things like that. Well, how, how about a drink? I could use one after the ride. No, thanks. Uh, well, I'll see you. Cattle? Did she say anything about where the money was hid? No. Nothing. Yeah. Too bad. So long. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Gene Lansworth, Harry Bartell, Richard Perkins, and Jack Boyles. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman, Bud Sewell speaking. <laughs>